Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this week, I answer questions on where we live. Eurasia, Ben talks about the biggest animals in the ocean. Whales. And I look at the camera. Thank you, Ben. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Science Advances has taken a look at the mystery behind the formation of Earth. Two models of rocky planetary formation currently exist, one of these being the idea that the larger protoplanets gained mass from the large amount of pebbles which drifted towards the young Sun from the outskirts of the solar system. This study refutes this model, however, and instead the data gathered supports the idea that the Earth was formed during the constant collision of a mass of planetary embryos in the inner solar system. The reason this model has been supported instead of the pebble accretion model is because of the low amount of the outer solar system material found both in Earth and our close neighbour, Mars. As you might imagine, the formation of the planets in our solar system is so much easier for us to study at the moment, so the more we understand about how planets in our solar system formed, the more we can understand about planets that inhabit the rest of the universe. In other news, a study published in the journal Molecular Ecology has looked at the mitochondrial DNA of fossilised cave lions and brown bears to help them understand their migrations from Eurasia into North America. Both these animals crossed into North America across the Bering Land Bridge, a bit of land that used to connect the far east of Russia and the western parts of Alaska. But the Bering Land Bridge wasn't a constant, it came and went, and the study suggests that species moved across in multiple waves. The study also challenges the commonly believed notion that ecosystems usually remain stable for thousands to millions of years, unless there is a mass extinction event or human interference. They use this idea of multiple migrations to explain the reappearance of brown bears in certain regions of North America where they had previously disappeared. The study similarly found that cave lions had local extinctions multiple times in the same area, and its data suggests a change in their ecosystem that encouraged these local extinction events. A warmer pre-Ice Age climate is suggested, with a sudden drop in temperatures dramatically changing the ecosystems of these animals suggesting that these ecosystems have, at points in history, been quite changeable. And now over to Ben, with news about a statue. Thanks, Doug. Well, starting off the paleontology news this week is the wonderful announcement that the proposed statue of Mary Anning has finally been approved by the Dorset Council. The statue, which will celebrate the incredible life and achievements of the paleontologist, is set to be unveiled on the 21st of May this year, which marks Mary's 223rd birthday. It's really good news for the campaign behind the statue, and I'm incredibly excited to go and see it when it's revealed at last. Also in the news is a paper describing newly identified dinosaur footprints on the coast of Wales. A section of shoreline near the town of Penarth in South Wales preserves large but unfortunately poorly preserved late Triassic aged impressions that some had thought were simply sedimentary structures, but are now re-identified as tetrapod trackways. These tracks are proposed to belong to the Ichnotaxon Eosauropus, meaning they were potentially made by an early sauropodomorph dinosaur, adding more context to these animals' very sparse record from the late Triassic of the UK. Interestingly, the study also utilises historical photogrammetry to digitally map how much of the site has been lost since its documentation in 2009, finding that from that year until 2020, over one metre of the surface exposure was lost. The study therefore shows just how vulnerable our fossil resources can be, especially along coastal sections, and how important it is to quickly gather data about such sites before they are lost. And finally for this week is the exciting news that a whole series of papers have just been published detailing the results of a decade of study on the incredible frozen woolly mammoth mummy known as Yuka. These papers, five of them in total, analyse various aspects of Yuka's biology, ecology and history of study, with some absolutely incredible discoveries being made. This specimen, discovered in August of 2010 near the southern shore of the Laptev Sea in Russia, is dated to between 40,100 and 39,000 years old and seems to have been about five and a half at the time of death. Based on the morphology of the hide in the genital area, the researchers also concluded in one of the studies that Yuka is a female. Additionally, they found evidence suggesting that the missing body parts, such as the absence of many internal organs and certain bones, plus tooth marks on the head and right side of the body, are most likely because Yuka was hunted by cave lions or other large carnivores, but survived this attack and escaped into a mud hole, where she subsequently died and was partly scavenged. 
Another incredible discovery made thanks to this specimen is the revelation that mammoth trunks are actually shaped quite differently to modern elephant trunks. It was found that a transverse expansion, termed a trunk hood, was present in the lower third of the appendage. This structure actually more than doubles the diameter of this section of the trunk and when looked at in cross section is ellipsoidal in shape instead of oval. Lateral skin folds rim this expanded area and may have been able to stretch too, resembling the hood of a cobra when fully opened, hence the name given to it. When the trunk was stretched out, this hood would have collapsed, but then when the trunk was coiled up, it would have snugly covered it. So the researchers suggest that this was in fact possibly a structure that aided in keeping the tip of the trunk warm when exposed to particularly cold conditions, with the mammoths rolling the trunk up to fit in their hoods. And that's just absolutely adorable, honestly. And in case that wasn't enough of a remarkable discovery, the researchers studying Yuka also found that her entire brain has been mummified and preserved as a single structure, making this the first and currently only known case of a complete brain from a fossilised animal more than 39,000 years old being preserved like this. Frozen specimens of other mammals from the Pleistocene have always lacked a structured brain, at best preserving unstructured nervous tissue, since this type of tissue is generally one of the first to decay after death. So the fact that Yuka's brain is intact and was able to be extracted as a single structure from the skull is absolutely incredible. CT scanning of the brain has revealed a lot about the external anatomy of the organ, as well as some internal structures too, which is just quite literally mind-blowing. So some absolutely phenomenal discoveries about woolly mammoth anatomy there that once again illustrates how utterly amazing these frozen specimens are and how invaluable they are to science. Back to Dog in the Studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for seven days of science this week. I do hope you enjoyed and we'll see you at some point later in the year.